we're going to hear uh, in our second uh, discussion of lunch, uh, we're going to hear from a group of pioneers and leaders who are, who are doing the work on the ground of trying to figure out how to make our apprenticeship system reach a whole lot more people than it currently is. Um, this discussion is going to be led by Angela Hanks of the um, uh, Center on American Progress, and I have my notes here on it, and I am, hold on, mis failing miserably here. One second. Okay. Angela is the Associate Director of the Economic and Workforce Development Division at the <laughs> Center on American Progress, uh, where she, uh, she writes and researches and engages in policy development exercises in relation to workforce development and apprenticeship. Um, Angela has been published in uh, Newsweek, uh, USA Today, and a number, and, and on Market Watch. Um, for those of you who are, have not read her stuff, I would encourage you to do so. A lot of it's available on the CAP website. She writes very clearly and eloquently about apprenticeship and makes a great case for it, as well as uh, coming up with great policy recommendations to uh, move it forward. And before Al Angela was at the Center on American Progress, of course, she was at the National Skills Coalition. So um, we can see how how things. Uh, we're all part of a larger community here at uh, uh, at Apprenticeship Forward. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, to Angela, and, uh, and to all the panelists. Thanks so much. All right, great. Thank you, Thank you so much, Mary Alice. Uh, so admittedly, we have a tough act to follow, uh, but we will do our best. Um, some really incredible, uh, impressive apprentices that we heard from there. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, the panelists with some abbreviated bios. Um, if you'd like to learn more about them, the bios are in your notebook, or um, you can come talk to them after the panel. So uh, first up is Bridget Gaynor. Bridget is the Vice President of Global Public Affairs for Aon and a Commissioner on the Cook County Board. Her career at Aon has spanned finance and strategy, and most recently, Bridget has led the effort to bring apprenticeships into the financial services sector. This January, Aon hired 26 young men and women from neighborhoods across Chicago in a partnership with the Chicago City Colleges. And we'll hear more about that today. Uh, next is Edison Freer. Edison is the gate director of the Gateway Initiatives at Jev's Human Services in Philadelphia, where he was working to expand apprenticeship opportunities for underserved populations by developing sector-based career pathways programs. As part of this work, Edison is also engaged in developing technical assistance strategies and support for employers seeking to start apprenticeship programs. Prior to joining Jevs, Edison was uh, Director of Educational Technology at the School District of Philadelphia, where he founded the Urban Technology Project, uh, the longest running continuous information technology registered apprenticeship program. We'll get into more detail on that as well. And then finally, uh, we have Ariane Hezewick, who is Program Director for Employment and Earnings at the Institute for Women's Policy Research, an independent research institute in Washington, DC. She is responsible for IWPR's research on earnings, occupations, and workplace discrimination, and she directs IPR's, IPWR's work for the U.S. Department of Labor's Gen Gender Equity and Apprenticeship Grant. She's a specialist in comparative resource management uh, with a focus on policies and legislative approaches, approaches to facilitate greater work-life reconciliation and gender equality, both in the U.S. and internationally. So uh, before I turn to the panel, uh, Mary Alice did some uh, table setting at the beginning, um, but I think you know we're we're talking about today we're talking about uh, expanding apprenticeship in, in in different ways. So we're talking about entering to new industries, and we're also talking about uh, diversity and inclusion. And this diversity piece is really essential. Um, if we're talking about you know the president has said um, that he would like to see five million new apprenticeships, that is a tremendous amount of growth from where we are now. And really, given the demographics of our country given the goals that we want to accomplish through apprenticeship, you can't just leave diversity to the end. It can't be like, oh, well, now we need to do diversity. This is really about addressing structural barriers that people of color, that women face, um, that underserved communities face to getting these good jobs that we know can work. So, um, so given that, I think we, I would like to have a discussion today talking about how we can make sure that more people have access to these programs, and we have some wonderful experts who can actually talk about uh, the important work of actually doing that uh, in practice. So uh, first, I would like to go to Bridget. Uh, so Bridget, you, uh, as I mentioned in January, recently launched an apprenticeship program in the insurance industry, and we got, just got to hear from one of your apprentices. So I think, you know, as Allison mentioned, for many of us, we don't think of insurance when we think of apprenticeship. We have a very uh, kind of clear idea of what an apprentice is that um, I think many of us in this room are working uh, to expand on. Um, so so why, why did you choose to do an apprenticeship? How did this come about? And what, why? Why, why do it? Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, 
for being here. This is a great opportunity. So, you know, when you think about the reason that skilled trades do so well with apprenticeships is because the employer and the edu and the training stay so closely uh, knit together. And so the, the employee is always offering what the market is looking for. And so that's a kind of a constant feedback loop. I think one of the interesting things we got to in this country, if you look at, you know, the pendulum really shifted to a high degree of college attendance after World War II, and a lot of large corporates kind of defaulted into hiring from a four-year college pipeline. It no longer meant that the employers were actually demanding what the colleges were teaching for certain roles. It just became a habit. And so several years ago, you know, Aon is in Chicago. We're two blocks away from Harold Washington College, which is one of the city colleges. And there was a desire to kind of reconnect them with employers. And we realized, you know, we'd never hired anyone from Harold Washington and didn't have a relationship there. So we gathered a bunch of employers together and we helped them redo their curriculum to make it more kind of connected to what employers were actually looking for in financial services. Next, we hired some interns and then we really kind of looked at apprentices in, in financial services and in, you know, in business are pretty common outside of this country, in Germany, in the UK. We have a large operation in the UK. And so the thought was, well, if they can do it there, then why can't we do it here? And so for me, it was both professional, we had a huge opportunity to get talent that was really blocked from coming to our company because you put up this barrier of a four-year college at 18. Um, but it was also very personal. You know, I, I grew up in Chicago and I went to our state university at a time where it was a couple thousand dollars a year and I was able to pay for that as a waitress and not in, engage debt. But now, you know, that same college is $30,000 a year. And so we looked at it and said, there's a huge opportunity for us to get a hold of some great talent. And to Angela's point, just because you went to an Ivy League school or a top tier school, you know, there's a danger of a kind of a uniformity of thinking. And diversity means diversity of thought. It's not the usual suspects, it's, it's race, it's gender, but it's also perspective and economic background. And that makes us much richer. And so we decided to approach this apprenticeship and we looked at all of our entry level jobs and really examined which ones actually required four years of college and where had we just defaulted. And we found a whole range that did not really require four year degree. And so then we looked at what the attrition was and some of these jobs had really high attrition. And so we went to the manager and said, what if you had the opportunity to get someone who was maybe a little younger, a little less experienced, but you were probably gonna hang on to them a lot longer because that has been our experience outside of the US that the engagement and retention for apprentices is much higher and much longer. So we made this business case because this is not a social program and it's not something that people are gonna do because they feel good about it. It's absolutely meeting a business need. And so we're very bullish on the future and you know we launched in January and we plan to continue to launch a cohort. We have 26 apprentices of which 20 are African American or Latino. And that is a, not a typical entry level class for us or for many large financial services companies in Chicago. So we think that this can both give us access to great talent it can reduce the barriers to uh, a young person who just doesn't have the financial wherewithal to go to university at this stage, but it also creates an opportunity to address some of the barriers that Angela mentioned. Thanks. Uh, so, so Edison, uh, along similar lines uh, in the non-traditional industry, so you founded the Urban Technology Project in Philadelphia. Uh, so you've uh, already been working to promote access to apprenticeship among underrepresented groups. Not only that, you're doing it in the tech sector, which particularly with the um, larger tech firms in the country have almost become notorious uh, for their lack of diversity. Uh, so. You know, this morning uh, in our breakouts, we talked about expanding into new industries. Can you talk about how to do that while ensuring ec equitable access? Good afternoon. Um, thank you. Um, you know, as we look at that question, you know, we, I, I think we, we've approached it at two levels. Uh, from the business perspective, um, you know, you need to think about that diversity right, is good for business. Right? You know, but people in those decision making positions, really have to become engaged in ensuring that that becomes a reality. So part of it is proof in the pudding. So there is research that shows that, you know, companies that are strong with uh, inherent and acquired diversity, as Bridget had mentioned, out-innovate and outperform other companies. So there's your business case, mm -hmm. right? And then you turn that around and say, 
at the se second sort of place where we need to look is that the talent that you're going to find, you know, is not just near; it has to be wider and deeper. So the work needs to be done on early awareness and approaching populations that you wouldn't think, you know, are ready for the IT sector. And then when you talk about the IT sector, it's not specifically just the IT sector. IT, as other folks have said, cuts across different industries. So that affords multiple opportunities mm -hmm. for entry level positions, multiple opportunities of a pipeline that has different paths of entry and different paths of exit and opening lots of doors uh, in terms of scaffolding and developing career pathways. So from the perspective of um, um, a, a business, if you are consistent about your mission and you're really bought into this notion that innovation, uh, diversity breeds innovation, you know, then you have to do something about addressing the need to be introspective, to consider you know, what are the inherent biases that impact your sort of talk and not ability to walk it. Mm -hmm. And you know, that might involve looking at your HR department. Is that the gatekeeper looking at your onboarding? What is it about your onboarding that might impact the success of retaining the inclusivity of the workforce, uh, the work environment, and also your credential barriers, as Bridget mentioned. You know, so you know, um, I listened to Jennifer earlier in the IT discussion, and she was dead on. You know, IT sector is so addicted to four-year degrees. So we need to help them, you know, get the medicine, <laughs> if you will, and think about what can they do to think about, you know, what are the entry points? And as Bridget mentioned, you know, we did an analysis of the IT sector. We look at that perhaps 40%, as Jennifer has pointed out, um, require an advanced degree. And then 60% of those jobs can be something else. So I think of a, the apprenticeship system as an opportunity, as a gateway, mm -hmm. if you will, to different populations. And again, now we look at companies saying, well, I need the talent now. But we can do that, and uh, Apprenti seems to be a very promising model. And there are other companies, do, uh, excuse me, um, entities doing that kind of work, which is what can we do now to meet your needs for upskilling, all right, and possibly the backfill. And then there's the, you know, so that's sort of the now. But if we look at the tech sector, it has such growth potential. We need to think about the long haul. Mm -hmm. And in thinking about the long haul, that affords the opportunity to engage what, you know, Mary noted, the opportunity youth. The 5.5 million young people who are not engaged in work or in, a, in, in schooling who I believe, and I think you know, uh, our, our experiment in, in Philadelphia show that there's deep talent and it's unrealized. So that's a longer haul and a longer sort of game plan. And when you look at that uh, sort of model, you really need to looking at sort of what are the systems we need to put in place to ensure that they're successful in an apprenticeship system. So um, the urban technology work was sort of developed from a um, an organic process. What did the employer need? But also listening to what the young people needed. So it's a very holistic approach, which is, it's not just about a widget that can do a job, but about realizing the full potential of the person. And in doing that, I have to say, it's about rolling up your sleeves. And it's hard work. And you just have to acknowledge that. And in that process, you know, it's sort of also an idea of um, discovering what the needs are, because it's not the same, it evolves. And in that process of discovery is understanding some fundamental principles. And what I've learned from the youth is that they are indeed interested in tech careers, especially the disconnected youth, but they just don't know how to access it. And if they do have access to that, often, is through sort of programs that don't represent themselves and at a gut sort of response 
it doesn't resonate. So, you know, being politically correct right now, it's like, you know, the Gates of the world, the Zuckerbergs of the world, you know, don't necessarily reflect and make those dreams re realizable for a lot of people that look like me or mm -hmm. others. And so this comes to what companies need to do. They need to invest in diversity and they need to understand that it's important to begin to develop talent that's diverse from the get-go. Um, the other thing about young people to teach is that they want to serve their communities. And they truly, man, just want a good career that affords them dignity. But then they also love their families. And often there's a dissonance between what the families want and what the young pe people seek. So you also have to engage the families and think about how do they sort of help transform uh, in, in, in that, because it's about a transformation, you know, sort of that dream of where they want uh, their children to come, uh, go, and respecting where young people sort of uh, want to do and how they're going to get there. So um, we developed a pre-apprenticeship program model using the AmeriCorps model. So part of it is being strategic. You know, pre-apprenticeship programs are really difficult to sort of invest in, and they're not really formalized. So the miracle program, uh, it's a federal subsidized program that uh, allows any young person, any person, to give service for a year to our country. So we took that and said, well, isn't that a great opportunity to build case management, to ensure this and stipend, to be the first job before the apprenticeship program? And also to look at it as the opportunity to dabble in different areas of technology. And then last but not least is the opportunity, especially for this population, to address the insecurities that impact the success in an apprenticeship. I'm talking about transportation insecurity, childcare insecurity, housing insecurity, food insecurity. Because you need to understand that those things get in the way of success in an apprenticeship. <coughs> so that's important in terms of the holistic approach is addressing those issues. Mm -hmm. And so, and also knowing that it's, you know, um, it takes different times, uh, excuse me, the lengths of, for young people to achieve a position where they can take um, advantage of an apprenticeship program. And what we did too with the, uh, our, our model is that then we built the entry level position, computer support specialist, as the entry point for um, our graduates of our pre-apprenticeship program, knowing with our employer, which was the school district, that that was the short-term goal, but thinking about the long-term investment and saying, this is the entry pathway, but we're going to paint this picture for these young people about the different doors that they can uh, scaffold and move on in, mm -hmm. the, in, in, <coughs> in the organization. So the registered apprenticeship program, you know, being the first job, is also the opportunity for the young people from this background to really excel because they bring a lot of skills to the table. Um, the skills are resiliency, persistence, you know, having to deal with failure, you know, and it all sounds, you know, as I was looking at all, checking off those sort of characteristics, re I realized that in the tech sector, that's what we want. We want <coughs> people who are adaptable, we want people who are trainable, and we, one people who are committed to lifelong learning. So um, I uh, want to go to, to Ariane next. Um, so Mary Ellis highlighted this in her opening remarks um, that women are se severely underrepresented uh, in apprenticeship programs writ large. They only make up 7% of apprentices. If you dig down deeper to uh, construction apprentices, it's just 2%. Uh, so not only are they underrepresented overall, they're most underrepresented in the highest wage jobs. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about what participation in apprenticeship means for women's economic security and how do we know if we're achieving that? How do we measure it? Um, thank you. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, basically what we have at the moment, I think, are s a lot of apprenticeship programs for men and a few lower paid ones for women. 
So even the 7% kind of overstates the integration that there mm -hmm. is. Um, although I want to say at the outset, specifically on construction, there are more women who work in construction trades than there are dental hygienists, right? And I think that's really important because nobody thinks that dental hygienist is kind of strange for women, but everybody thinks that it's strange, uh, um, that construction work is. So what, does, what do apprenticeships mean for um, women? I think it's pretty much the same as they mean for men. It means a clear and affordable pathway to a good job with a certification that is recognized, hopefully, nationally. Or at least that's what it should mean. And I, I'm German, so, you know, kind, kind of, that's apprenticeship is like what I grew up with. Um, and this matters, in a way, it matters even though it matters more for women than for um, men because we probably all know and we get this told to us, we know women are more likely, young women in school and afterwards to, to be good at school, to get um, educational attainment, to go to college, to end up with college debt, to end up with larger college debt and to end up in jobs that pay less, so make it even harder to pay off the college debt. Um, I just um, visited the, um, the, the, the iron workers, um, the union and the contractor together are the only union at the moment who run their own pre-apprenticeship program for women. And they do this because they realize um, that they need to attract um, a more diverse Workforce, they get more women to come into it. In, uh, in iron work, it's like it was under 2%. Um, and at that program, it's the third cohort in just um, 18 months, and they're always um, well kind of filled. Um, out of 24, there were four women there who had college debt around $80,000, mm. right? So you just think, <laughs> ouch, exactly. Um, but there were also two young women there, which was really encouraging, who had been sent, you know, learned, had taken welding credit at high school. Um, and they came in through lots of different avenues, and they came because A, they liked the physical work, B, because they knew it was going to put them into a good job. And if you look at the kind of middle skill jobs that we are looking at, high level of um, skill shortages, future job opportunities, um, partly because you know, we, the economy is growing again, partly because of demographic change, um, that typically don't need a four-year college degree. They are incredibly gender segregated. You know, if you think about it, um, airline mechanics, 2% women. You, I mean, you don't even have to live that much. You don't have to travel around that much. You don't have to work outside all the time. Um, all construction, 3% women. It's, it's kind of mind boggling, but I think we all have gotten used to it in some way. Um, so we, we kind of feel that at this point in time, given the demographic change, given the interest in apprenticeship, and given the support from the Department of Labor to kind of re-kick gender, that we may have an opportunity to move, you know, the, move the kind of post um, towards higher levels. And the programs that we work with as part of the consortium, like the, the iron workers, very quickly, they went up from, okay, it's not very high yet, but from about, um, 2% apprenticeship in California is to 7% women apprentices in California. In, in Boston, a program we work with, um, they have more than tripled um, the number of apprenticeships and it's now 500 in the building trades. You know, it's still not masses, but it's really great success. Thanks. Uh, so I think we have time for one, maybe two questions if we're quick. Um, so make it a really good one. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. Oh, 10 more minutes for, oh. Oh, no, 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 let's, let's, let's go for it. Um, 
just kidding. We're going to talk a little bit more. Um, so I might, I might take your question. Uh, so um, Bridget, one thing that we, we talked about when we did the prep call is, um, you know, women and people, people of color face myriad barriers to the labor market, whether it's employment uh, discrimination from the start or challenges advancing once you get into employment. So what, how is Aon working to address that through its apprenticeship program, and what do you think other companies should be doing to diversify their workplaces? So I think to some degree it's, it's two questions, because when you look at diversity over the span of a company, there's entry level, and then there's mid-career, and then there's senior executive. So at entry level, women actually come in at even ranks to men. People of color um, are different, African Americans and Latinos, less so Asians and Indians, pretty equal proportion. Um, but then what you see is you see a lack of advancing. You see an advancing for the first couple of years, and then there's this drop off. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it correlates to childbearing or it's people, you know, look around and they think, well, I'm not going to really make it up, so I'm, I'm going to move out from there. So, as I mentioned, the apprentice program, it's split between men and women. It's intentionally and very, you know, we, we went out of our way to ensure that we're getting a diverse class because part of the ability to retain people over the course of time is to create a cohort and a network and you know this idea that you're not so isolated and only and so you kind of create some critical mass. So that's our goal in that regard. When it comes to that, one of our goals is to increase, and I see that Al Crook is here from Zurich and Zurich also has an apprenticeship in the insurance industry and our goals jointly are to bring a whole range of other companies involved. So we have 50 apprentices between the two of us you know, a year. We want to make that be 500 in Chicago. And so there are several large banks and other insurance companies and others who are on the cusp, I believe, of making the decision. And so the thing that I would say is that you know, our view is we were willing, we want to be the proof of concept. It works. You've seen some apprentices. This is, you can talk to the managers. We've been really bullish about kind of lobbying our colleagues in the industry to adopt more because it's when you get to critical mass that you actually start to see some success. Um, as a firm, we want to address diversity over the mid-career and senior. We're, you know, it, it's kind of the typical way. You have to create goals. So our goals are um, diversity in 30 percent for um, for women and people of color throughout the ranks. We have different levels of how people are ranked. Um, and then it's it's set the goal. It's make the goal um, a part of people's evaluation because if you don't make it a part of the manager's evaluation, then obviously it becomes more of a talking point and less of a reality. And and then it's to how do we measure ourselves year after year and what are we doing? And we have, you know, a lot of explicit conversations. How do you ensure that woman a woman goes off on maternity leave? She knows that there's a long-term plan. How do you increase flexibility? You know, there's a whole you know there's a myriad of options, but none of it happens without being highly intentional. So there's a strategy at the, at the entry level, there's a strategy at the mid-career, and then there's a strategy at the senior executive. And it has to be intentional, and diversity has to be something that people stop seeing as like something I should do because it's the right thing, which it is. But you should also look at it as embedded in the future success of your business, because now when we, and I'm sure a lot of other companies, uh, respond to an RFP, go in to see a client, they want to see a diverse group of people there because especially, you know, that's who their buyers are, that's who their own executives are, and to think that that's not relevant to your business is really to put your head in the sand. Mm -hmm. and that's great. Thank you. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, um, I would like to move on to the policy. So we've talked a lot about kind of like what you can do from a programmatic perspective, but ultimately the way you get systems change is through policy change. So um, I'll, I'll go to Ariane first and then I'll, I'll pose the same, same question to Edison and Bridget, but, but, but what are the policies that are missing and what, what do you think is encouraging? So we've got a new regulation from, from DOL and Equal Opportunity Employment. Um, there's been a lot of work to, to um, put out these contracts for uh, equity intermediaries, but so what, where have we come and where do you think we need to be headed if we're really thinking about making these programs inclusive for, for women, for people of color, for people with disabilities, uh, for individuals with, with, with criminal records, um, people who really face challenges um, and, and might go overlooked by employers who really do need skilled workers? Um, so t to my mind, a lot of 
the elements are there, but probably need more funding and need to be lifted up. Um, in, in the field that I mainly work on, um, non-traditional, well, occupations where women are un underrepresented in construction, transportation, manufacturing, pre-apprenticeship programs um, are very important. And particularly they're important for women because women often haven't had the same chance at home to learn about trades, tools, build up the confidence. Uh, and they also face an enormous amount of skepticism when they step into the workplace. Um, so pre-apprenticeship programs kind of do a, do have a dual function. They help the, the apprentice or the pre-apprentice feel confident, but they also are like a stamp of approval to say, this person is good, she can do it. Um, so I think, and, and you know, and then what you need, the second issue, and um, the Institute for Women's Policy Research just completed a big study on support service and job training programs in career and technical education, which um, included some apprenticeship programs and really lifted up the issues of transportation, case management, and childcare. And for women particularly, um, childcare, unfortunately, is you know, it's, it's a big barrier, it's a big issue, um, and even more at um, almost the, the, the programs that are community college or, or technical colleges, um, because not everybody has TANF money, and sometimes the programs are short, and you go below it, and when you look at this, you know, this, you talk to programs that manage to get through a lot of women, um, or help a lot of women get through, um, and you can see that one year they have childcare, then the other year they don't, and then one year it covers this population and maybe that, it's, you know, childcare is expensive. We work with one wonderful program, um, Moore um, House in Mississippi in Biloxi, who have a um, construction training program for women, place a lot of them into um, chip building, uh, they now, through the Department of Labor, have a caseworker who works specifically on helping people find childcare, and that childcare follows them until the end of the year, the financial year. Doesn't you know? It's not very logical, but that's funding. <laughs> but it really has increased and varied the number, the type of people um, that they get through the program. So pre-apprenticeship program and more secure funding streams for support services. Okay, um, and do you two have anything to add in the next one or two minutes or should we go to questions? Yeah, so I affirm that. And the thing about, it's not just about pre-apprenticeship programs, it's really making the systems work better. So, you know, in, in, this, in this arena, you're looking at, you know, frankly, the ability to build public-private partnerships because you need to braid funding, you need to braid services and supports, and they have to be holistic, and they have to move from one phase to another. So you can see that it's not just a matter of you know, policy informing, but the policy informing collaboration. And um, the other piece about this is that you know, when you look at all this investment, it needs to be sustainable. And when you talk about sustainability, you're really talking about ecosystems infrastructure being developed. And that has to involve a conversations at a local level that brings in sort of the policies that municipalities or counties can address. The, the use, well, in the, the good investment of the workforce systems, the policies of themselves as a municipal employee, and then also impacting or enforcing sort of some of the, you know, so using the regulations um, as a means to start these conversations. And these conversations also with, you know, that extend to anchor institutions that ha may have a civic engagement with the communities, and then we have to help them think about that civic engagement becoming a reality in terms of investments in enhancing underrepresented com uh, communities finding uh, jobs through apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. I'll just make one comment. So um, I know that we were talking earlier about Senators Booker and Scott, as well as um, Representatives Lipinski and Rodney Davis, both of whom are from Illinois. They are introducing an, an apprenticeship tax credit. Yeah. 
And so part of this is awareness, you know, just getting it out to the larger economic um, system around, hey, this is some, something to think about. You might not have thought about it before. And so they're going to have this incentive program. It's going through. And I just think, you know, for all the downsides of the volatile moment that we're in right now politically, there's also taxes are on the table, infrastructure is on the table, so is financial services reform. And opening those three areas up seems to me ripe for opportunities to start to insert really, as I said before, intentional um, changes and incentives around apprentices. Because you know the pendulum, as I said before, it swings over one way, it's probably going to come back to the center where training and education are more closely linked. So I would keep my eye on the, that bill that's going to go through Congress. But as we debate infrastructure taxes and financial services reform, let's not lose sight of the opportunities to integrate apprentices into those changes. Yes, that is a great place to start on questions, a good advocacy charge for, for everyone in the room. Uh, so uh, let's go to questions. Uh, over here. Oh, we'll go here first. Hi, I'm Marie Karosi from Seattle. Um, we've seen great progress in kind of moving the needle on the construction side. So a lot of great programs on pre-apprenticeship, access. But, you know, if you think seven, in 1970 there were 10 black construction workers in Seattle. And it wasn't until court order, so policies started taking place. Great programs, but we yet, in 2017, there are huge disparities in completion rates and journeying out rates of people of color and women. So as we're moving forward in developing more programs about access, it's not always about getting that person in the door or fixing that person's skills, but it's how do you create an environment that is inclusive and that is, you know, so people aren't being hazed on the job. So as the apprentice said, being thick-skinned. We've talked to joint apprenticeship coordinators that said, folks of color have come with a chip on their shoulder because they don't accept racist remarks. And so I would just say the call out is not just about access and opportunity, but really about how do we change practices so that we address those disparities and we, we, we create inclusive workplaces. Absolutely. I'll make one really quick comment on that. So. Um, when we set up the apprentice program, there's three parts of it. There's the employer, there's the school, which is Harrow Washington and City College. But we put an organization called One Million Degrees, which is based in Chicago, and its whole focus is, you know, getting people from non-traditional backgrounds, race, gender, um, sexual identity, and, and background into career track jobs. And they're that middle ground that can really act as an advisor, a advocate, uh, protector, any of one of these roles, because you have someone who's new to any kind of environment. You might be young, you might be, it, it might be the first time you're exposed to, whether it's corporate or construction trades or anything else. And building in that buffer between, you know, just not assuming that the person is going to be able to negotiate all of the things they may be confronted with on the job site, and instead of creating an environment where they either have to suck it up or leave, that you've got to build in this middle piece that says, we know that someone's gonna confront obstacles of any sort. We're gonna make sure that there's someone in the middle who can kind of help negotiate some of that stuff and mean that there's, their likelihood of success is much greater. And I think if you don't do that, it's both naive, but it undermines the people who are kind of least likely to be successful to actually complete the program. All right, uh, next question over here. Hi, I'm Deb Seymour from Entangled Solutions. My question is actually about boot camps. So in some of the trades, or I should say some of the industries that we've been talking about, boot camps have become very popular ways of training those who either already have a college degree or are not in a position to acquire a college degree or really don't want to acquire a college degree. So I'm just wondering what your perspectives are on how boot camp training fits in with pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship training, and what are the advantages and disadvantages to somebody who comes to you from already been trained in a boot camp? Thank you. Um, boot camps is one part of the solution, but it also, as you say, it's fraught with some challenges. Um, it's a, fa a way to fast track you know, the opportunity into the tech sector. But um, you also have to be conscious that might there be inherent biases there that leave other under underrepresented populations to engage with that? 
So it's about looking at what is it, what's the, how does it fit appropriately, you know, meeting the needs of that sector, uh, and is the employer sort of as rigid as possible ready to address those needs? So intermediaries play a key role in sort of ensuring that that is successful tra transition. And so when we look at boot camps, we also have to think about what work, and, and my colleague here alluded to this, what work needs to be done, and pre-apprenticeships become very critical for that. Sort of creating early awareness, early exposure, and the resiliency to succeed in a boot camp, and then how does the boot camp itself uh, become enmeshed in this, or in, in included in a apprenticeship system that becomes holistic in its approach of support for the person, but also for the employer's ROI. All right, uh, we've got time for one or two more. Oh, yes, one in the back over here. Good afternoon, um, I'm Lauren Sugarman from Chicago Women in Trades. And I started my career in the trades as a direct result of affirmative action. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about, Bridget, when you say intentionality. Mm -hmm. But it was intentionality with measurement and with pressure and you know some incentives to continue to get federal contracts. Um, we've moved away from that. And I'm wondering if you all have recommendations about how we can link intentionality to more concrete measurement and performance and link it to economic development so that we can get back to real paths um, being created like I had. I think it's a great question. And what you're seeing now and what you're responding to is the, the government has kind of backed away from the requirements. And so, you know, this is our attempt to fill in some of that gap. It's not gonna fill the whole gap. And this gets back to the advocacy question that Angela brought up before. What needs to change on policy? It isn't just to incentivize people around apprenticeships, it's also to incentivize the behavior we'd like to see on our own but don't always. And so how do you codify that and make sure that it's not a whether or not you have somebody at a company who feels strongly about it and wants to do the right thing or wants to make it happen, but everybody has to step up to the plate. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you do that in a way that, you know, it aligns itself with what the business needs and, and part of that is, is strengthening things like city colleges in Chicago and, and other places because you have to have that um, training pipeline to feed in. And I know that the trades have done a lot on apprentice programs, pre-apprentice, but we still, at least us locally, I don't think we've totally cracked that nut about how to keep that pipeline wide and open. But your question is a good one and I think it's, you know, we're in Washington and this is kind of where people think about those broader issues. So I don't know if someone else has a, has a policy answer. Uh, actually, I had written down to butt in at the end accountability as mm -hmm. the issue that I'd forgotten mm -hmm. on policy. Um, and if we look at the areas where real progress has been made with shifting these really old patterns of, you know, girls aren't wanted here. Um, if we take Boston, in Boston you have a confluence of um, you know, a city commitment to employ local residents. You have the unions who pick up on this. You have the policy group for a tradeswomen's initiative, a group kind of a, a, a group from union, and it's luck in a way. You have women who are committed in unions in the universities um, together with people from business contractors coming together saying we need to do something and having the time to analyze thousands of contractor hours on looking at do they, do they actually employ as many women? Do they employ any women? What is it, you know, to say what's women, people of color, we want women who are people of color, you know? Uh, and the, the Boston um, Pathway Program, and we heard from Sylvia, actually is the only pre-apprenticeship program I know of that gets to 50% female participation and then 90% um, people of color. And that comes from accountability in the rules, but also having the resources to help people accountable and then provide technical assistance to turn things around. So, yeah. so you know, accountability and intentionality, but it comes down to the bottom dollar. So at the local level, 
It's about your procurement processes. You know, what makes you competitive? And you know, uh, aspirational needs to turn into concrete results. And as you said, you know, it's about bringing these sort of things together. And what, you know, in Philadelphia, what we're trying to do is get the city, which they've done terrific, is put together a strategic plan that informs the work that the workforce system does, the community colleges, as well as the CBOs that do a lot of the work around workforce investments. But most importantly, it's making a case that diversity is good for business and it's quantifiable. So at the end, it's that's what's going to drive you know, the self-interest. And it's important to not forget that. Okay, uh, last question. All right. Uh, Seeing no others, I will uh, wrap this up. Thank you so much, panelists, for a great discussion. I really Thank appreciate you. your expertise on these issues. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much. And that, that was an absolutely great discussion.